Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Rollbar. Move fast and fix things like we do here at ChangeLog. Check them out at Rollbar.com slash ChangeLog. Resolve your errors and minutes and deploy with confidence. Catch your errors in your software before your users do. And if you're not using Rollbar yet or you haven't tried it yet, they want to give you $100 to donate to open source via Open Collective. And all you got to do is go to Rollbar.com slash ChangeLog, sign up, integrate Rollbar into your app. And once you do that, they'll give you $100 to donate to open source. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. Welcome to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific at changelog.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the show at changelog.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at JS Party FM. And now on to the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of JS Party. I'll be your MC this week, Nick Nisi, and I'm joined today by Michael Rogers and Henry Zhu. Uh, Michael, welcome back to the show. Uh, you've been you were part of the original crew for JS Party, and uh, it's great having you back. Yeah, yeah, it's great to be back. Yeah. So, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, catch us up with where you're at right now. Uh, yeah, well, I had a baby, and so <laughs> that was one of, one of the, the things that made scheduling more difficult. Yeah. Uh, and I had some other kind of standing meetings in the way that they were difficult for scheduling, um, but a lot of that shifted around now. So I'm back, and I'll, I'll probably be back uh, every every month or so, something like that, uh, <laughs> trying to make it work. That's awesome. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm Michael Rogers. I've done you know Node stuff since the early days. Um, used to run the Node.js Foundation. Uh, now I work on a lot of decentralized data structure stuff at uh, Protocol Labs, which is pretty fun. Very cool. Love open source. Yeah, and I <laughs> I knew of you from um, from that the Node Foundation stuff and NodeConf, I think. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I started NodeConf and ran it for about seven years. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, of course, the uh, awesome request library that's now being deprecated. So that's, that's awesome as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. A- and then, uh, Henry, welcome to the show. Uh, we're really glad to have you. Would you like to catch uh, catch us up with uh, yourself? Yeah, um, I guess uh, I've been working on Babel full time for um, like I'm a little bit more over a year now, um, and then I for some reason got into podcasts. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, really happy to have you here as well. And of course, yeah, Babel kind of just core architecture of the web now. Uh, it seems, and it's it's a really great project. So thank you for working on that and doing it full time now. And then, yeah, you mentioned getting into podcasting. You have two shows uh, that you're currently doing, right? There's Maintainers Anonymous and Hope in Source. Would you like to tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, so I released Hope in Source, uh, I think it was last October. It was just did RFC with uh, Michael. Uh, we had a bunch of conversations and I started bringing up faith and how I thought it was related to open source. So figured we would just record it. And then I recently, I think like two or a few weeks ago, I released Maintainers Anonymous, which is kind of the same thing, except trying to apply that to everything. Um, so seeing everyone as a maintainer. And actually, I'm planning on making another podcast, but for Babel. So, but I haven't done that yet. So, yeah. Really cut the podcast bug, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we're really excited that you took some time to join us today uh, for a party. So thank you. Kind of the first thing that I, I thought we could talk about here is um, because you're both very prominent in open source, uh, maybe talking a little bit about uh, how you got there, what pulled you into open source, or what was the reason that you you started looking into that? I know this is a, a pretty common question, but but kind of catch us up on your decisions and what, what led you to where you're at today. Well, I almost feel like there are almost like not different levels, but there are different like in a way, I feel like maybe a lot of people go through this where like you've tried to do open source multiple times. So I remember like the first time I attempted to like, you know, making a GitHub account and all that, it was, I was actually contributing to Khan Academy and I thought it was cool that their exercises, um, I think this was like 
I don't remember what year this was, 2014 or something, or maybe before that, actually. And I thought it was cool that the exercise, like math exercises are open source. So I was like looking into like fixing some typos or adding a new thing. Um, and then like I tried that, like my first PR got closed because I didn't know how to like rebase correctly. I didn't know how to use Git. And I think like two years later, I was like, I, I went back and I was like, okay, I think I can try this again. <laughs> I had some help and then well, this is when I found out about Angular 1 and then I was using it. I thought I could contribute. So I was looking through the issues. I found this issue about like linting. So I like manually did some, you know, auto fixes and that's how I got my first PRs there. Um, and you know, I think I wanted to just cause I used a bunch of open source and never really thought about who worked on it. And I finally was like, oh, maybe I could be involved. I mean, there's, there's a lot more, but <laughs> that's how I got yeah. started. That's really awesome. Identifying that there's people behind that and wanting to join them and help them. That's, that's really awesome. That's something that we tend to forget from time to time. Michael, how about you? Uh, yeah, my story is quite a bit different. I mean, yeah, it's, it starts in like the nineties. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I mean, when I was really young, uh, I was a, a hacker and that was kind of how I learned how to program and ha- learned about computers. Um, and so with hacking, like there's always a community there, like you're always on IRC sort of having people show you different things. And so just the value of having a community to rely on and kind of bounce ideas off of and get pointers to and, and like informal kind of mentorship was always like really useful to me learning computer is even like really really young and uh and most of the reason why i was hacking is that i just wanted to learn more and we didn't have any like hardly and if we were really poor so we didn't have like any money for anything it was like a miracle that we had a computer and uh so hacking was like a way to to get into other systems to learn those systems uh, that i didn't have the money to really access and learn on my own then when I, i started working in the industry i gravitated towards open source for a lot of those same reasons and, um, you know, tried to do stuff here and there for like the first kind of four years when I was working for bigger companies. Uh, and then when I came down to the Bay Area, uh, I started working at the Open Source Applications Foundation, which is um, basically it was, it was a personal information manager in the style of Lotus 1, 2, 3, um, started by the guy who started Lotus, actually, Mitch Kapoor, who also helped found mm. Mozilla and stuff like that. Um, and there's like a long history with, with the OSAF actually like sort of helping set up the Mozilla Foundation and things like that. Um, so a lot of kind of crossover there. But it was a, a smaller team of like just really, really amazing people. Um, but a lot of them, you know, hadn't even done open source before. Like there were like three people from the original Macintosh team with like their names on the motherboard. Like it was wow. like a he- heavy people were working on this and this team of like, you know, 20 people. But uh, they hadn't really done a lot of open source. And so Ted Leung um, joined, who has like a long history with Apache, and done open source for a long time. And he, he did a lot of trying to teach values and teach people like how to do open source properly. Um, and I was pretty young at the time and really just soaked it up. Like I, I, all mm. the value stuff, I was just like really taking it in. And I thought that it was even more important for, for me actually, because so my team was building these new test tools. And the test tools were also open source, but they were kind of widely applicable. And we had far less resources to build and maintain these tools than the product team so we were like we need a community of contributors <laughs> like we need to do that because we're we like don't have any resources and it worked pretty well like a, a, one of the i mean osaf kind of crashed and burned in terms of like the actual product that we were building but a lot of these side projects not not just the stuff that i was building um ended up having like a much longer lifespan than the actual product and then after that i went to mozilla and at Mozilla, I found that I was actually adopting a lot newer practices than Mozilla was be- because I had gone through this, this stuff with Ted. And so there was some fun tension there. I was one of the first people to put projects on GitHub at the time hmm. at Mozilla, and they were not super receptive to that. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And then kind of from there, um, around that time, like my kind of last year at Mozilla, that was when Node.js was released. And so I'd been writing Python for like five years and, and getting involved in that community and in the Django community in particular. And a lot of the culture of Python had been defined already and it was very hard to sort of steer that ship in another direction. Hmm. And one of the things that was really attractive about Node in the early days was that you could tell that it was going to be a bit bigger, not, uh, no telling that it could it would be this big, but um, just the opportunity to work on a community at the ground level was really attractive to me and a few other people like Isaac. And so, yeah, I you know took a big role in, you know, that's why I ran the first conference and did a lot of the early community work and early module work and, and even some core work at the time so very cool and yeah so that's that's how i got involved (laughs) 
<laughs> I definitely think it gives you some street cred doing open source before GitHub. Uh, I can't even imagine <laughs> that yeah. universe. Well, actually, so this is funny. I was I was writing about the changes that were happening because back in like sort of 2012, 2013, people were seeing GitHub happen, but it was a, a full kind of generational split. There were these people that were like had only done open source on GitHub and people that were still holding out. And it, it was weird because I kind of had a foot in both worlds. Like I had done open source before then and I knew a lot of those people, mostly through TED actually. And then also I was like living in this new world. And so I ended up writing a bit about it. There's an article on Wired uh, that I wrote like back then that was, you know, just talking about like the overall changes that are going to happen in software and open source because GitHub has changed things so much. And the big thing was that it just reduces the barriers to starting a project. <laughs> like if you wanted to start an Apache project, like forget about the incubator and all that kind of stuff to like get, get a repo up. If you want to contribute, you have to learn like a new set of tools for almost each project, for almost every project. Hmm. And Apache sort of like codified that tool chain for Apache projects. But if you mm -hmm. go to some other open source project, it's a totally different tool chain, totally different governance model like how do i send you patches like you still had to like decide like are, are, do i send you emails with the patches in them like do i uh do, you know is there some kind of bug tracker there were like 40 different bug trackers that were open source people were using uh like there was just there, there was no standardization around this so just the, the cost of going from one project to another was really high so that's why you ended up with big projects because hmm. Adding every feature ever to the Apache HTTP server made sense because starting up another project and plugging two projects together and starting two communities was really hard. And so GitHub like normalized all that tooling. So now you can sort of flow between projects pretty easily because the the way that you contribute and send everything around and communicate is pretty normalized and, and standardized. Um, so there's like one onboarding for all of this. And then also just creating new projects is effectively free. So now we can create much smaller projects that are much like easier to understand and then string them together. And you've seen that play out over the last like 10 years, right? Like the way that applications are built is, is a, a big dependency chain and not a giant framework like Spring or something like that. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, my story is not uh, nearly as storied as either of yours. Uh, I try and contribute as much as I can. I'm part of the Dojo team, so I'm uh, working on that and really enjoying it and working with TypeScript a lot these days. But we, we kind of touched on this before. There's a lot of open source and a lot of why GitHub has made things so much better is because most of it is uh, tends to be dealing with people. Um, Henry, how would you say that is? Well, I, I guess what Michael was saying, like having GitHub be such a big part of open source introduces its own challenges. And I guess, because well, before maybe there was a lot less people involved in open source in general, and then maybe mm -hmm. team sizes. Everyone knows each other, and it was a lot more about people. But and not that it's not about people now. It's just like you don't. It's almost like you don't have to know who people are because you can just like go to a random repo and then make a PR, and then move on, kind of thing. And so, I mean, even like thinking about the name of the podcast I did, like Maintainers Anonymous. It's like yeah, in a way, a lot of people, you know, like you could use like people use Babel all the time. They have no idea who I am, and they don't have to. Um, and so. How do we balance like people not treating people in like their people and kind of like bringing back that community side into open source? Yeah, I, I feel like we're still like in the beginnings of figuring that out. Yeah, open source is people like that. We <laughs> we used to say that a lot more. We this was something that we, we talked about on Henry's podcast recently. But there was there was certainly a period of time where everything that we were talking about in open source was about people. Um, we weren't talking about sustainability and money really like at all um, at that time. And it was just about like people and making people happy and being more open and accepting. And yeah, like we, we somehow lost that over the last like five years or so. Um, hmm. the, convers the, the conversation has really shifted towards the sustainability side of things, I think, which is still about people, but it's not, it's yeah. just not framed the same way. I wonder why that is. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it, it does seem like there's, um, I guess, more of an emphasis on open source. And maybe this is just, you know, the the lens from which I see it, but everywhere uses open source in, in a lot of different ways. And, and the way that you were, like, especially in the Node community, like there's a lot of small packages and it's, it's just a dependency chain now instead of uh, a big monolith for a lot of projects. And there's a lot that goes into that, but like there's entire companies and entire applications that are built on this open source software. And if you, you're not thinking about how that software is going to be sustained, you're going to be left in the dust with, with um, you know, potential security issues or just not being maintained as, as things change in, in the ecosystem. And, and so it is a really big 
an important thing to think about as we adopt these frameworks and tools into our projects and into our lives in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, it's also a really unique challenge, right? Like when we had these big projects, you could sustain them because you could you know, line up investment um, either from companies or from individuals. Uh, but now that, you know, your, your product is built on this like dependency chain of hundreds of libraries, um, understanding like the, the particular needs around each one of those libraries is, is quite difficult and finding mm -hmm. a scalable, like a, a scalable sustainability strategy for them is also really difficult. Um, I think that's why I've I put a lot more time into sort of cultural changes lately because if you can change the culture around not just open source but around the way that companies think about open source and think about contributing to it you can have a much sort of broader effect um, than than you would have on any individual project, right like not every project is node.js like you're not going to get a foundation with a bunch of corporate sponsors lined up like that's yeah. a lot of infrastructure to run <laughs> I know I ran it <laughs> like um, <laughs> and it's certainly necessary for node um, but uh, you know you're not going to be able to line that up for, for even a, a project the size of Babel right like an entire foundation around it would be like overkill yeah i guess the long tail is not going to be node it's going to be like projects smaller than Babel. and it's like if we have a hard time raising money or fundraising then like it's going to be even harder for other people so. yeah so speaking of that how uh what are some of the ways that that you can go about fundraising for for projects henry i know that you have um like a patreon for example and there's other things like open collective uh, to raise money for projects. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of ways to do it, but I find that, I guess this is true of a lot of things. You end up just copying what other people do. And if there's someone that you know that's doing well, then you'll just do that. And so like, say Evan made the Patreon, it's like, okay, we're making a Patreon. And Webpack had an open collective. Okay, we're going to make an open collective. But then it's like, I think it's easy for people to just see that and see, think that if I do the exact same thing, I'm going to have the same amount of success. And so you got to do the hard work of actually like, I don't know, whatever it takes to, if, whether it's talking to companies or getting the name like out there, um, simply making a Patreon is not going to convince anyone to give you money. Um, because there's lots of people and it, it's like, doesn't even matter if you have like lots of followers or people know who you are. It's like, you have to... I don't know, just a different skill set than like writing code, I think, if, if you're talking about crowdfunding, at least. But, you know, I, in a way, I mean, donations is a weird thing to get into anyway. Like you're not tying like the input that you're putting into the output that you're getting out of it. And it's like maybe it makes more sense for your company or your project to do consulting or or other kinds of things. Yeah, that's like the secret uh, sustainability strategy that has worked consistently in open source, which is that like starting a consulting company tends to work, actually. Like a lot of people that do open source full time work for consulting companies and end up doing open source more or less full time as a part of that work. Um, you know, they're like not just the big companies, but just lots of lots of little companies as well. Um, I think the trick there is that like setting up a consulting business and running that business is a lot of work and is a very different skill set than open source maintenance. <laughs> so it's just not a, like an accessible means of sustaining most projects, right? Um, because it's like, okay, great, like I I want I want to support myself. Like, where do I find sales guys, <laughs> like an accountant and stuff? Yeah, so you do end up having to do a lot of those things on your own, mm -hmm. which takes away from the time that you might spend working on the code itself. Right. So, like, are you willing to do that? And I, I think most, it seems like most people don't want to. Um, and so I feel like this is where other companies can come in to, like, be that middle person to do that for you. Or, I mean, there are guides to, like, be a contributor and guides to be a maintainer, but we should have more, like, teaching on, like, how to do consulting or sales or whatever, that, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's really interesting. So uh, what advice would you give to uh, someone wanting to kind of follow a similar path to becoming a maintainer of an open source project? Um, <laughs> well, I don't know about following a similar path because, like, I, yeah, it does seem like everyone kind of, honestly, a lot of it feels kind of random. And a lot of it is, it just takes time. Like, I think... You know, you think about people that are maintainers, like I've been maintaining this for like years and it took me a few years just to be a contributor. And I don't know if people expect like they, they kind of just make a contribution and suddenly all this stuff's going to happen. It's like, I, I mean, I don't think anyone would want that because honestly, all you do is get more responsibility, right? So 
Although another another way is like when people get added as a maintainer on a project, it's because they already put in a lot of work, and it's more like you're getting recognized for like the work you've already put in. And so, um, and and so like having like commit rights and all that stuff is cool, but um, and it's on maintainers to kind of figure out like when they should do that and how I guess liberal they want to be with doing that. Like with Node, it's like okay, you can make PR, and then and now you can be a committer. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. I don't know. I think, um, there's like a ladder here, right? Like the projects need to build first of all. So you need to have like a support system so that when people do small things, they can also take on bigger things and bigger things at their own pace. But not everybody will do that. Some people will just do one thing and then leave and just really enabling people who have done a little bit to help out as much as Mm -hmm. they can is really important just for like sustaining the project. But my, my advice to people like getting into open source is always to just take on a thing that you already know how to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're going to learn how to do new things in the future, but like there's this, this social barrier to contributing to a new project where you're trying to feel out what that community and that project is like and if they're going to be mean and if they're actually accepting of new contributions and that whole thing. And just getting comfortable with the project is, is a process in and of itself. And so just take on a task that you already know how to do, whether it's like a doc update or a website update or some test update, like something relatively easy. Don't try to do a huge patch right away or try to add yeah. some giant feature, right? Like go through the process and learn a bit and get comfortable um, and then sit down and, and take on, you know, something bigger. Um, and then you'll also know like the people that you want to pay mm-hmm. to get support in that and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Like are you saying it's, it maybe it's a social thing where it's like, you just have to get to know the people on the project itself and then you'll feel like welcomed or, or empowered to actually make those changes. Like I, I think about the first PR I made to the JS linter I worked on was a readme update or to add a table of contents, which is like pretty trivial. Um, and then for Babel, I think I, Babel itself was trying to use ES6, so I just updated some code from ES5 to ES6. That was my first contribution. So like, I, I think, you know, whether it's like build tools or those kinds of things, like those are applicable to any project. Um, it's a good way to just getting your foot in the door. This episode is brought to you by Algolia, search technology to power your business, trusted by Twitch, Stripe, Adobe, and many more, even us. Yes, we use them to power our search, and we love the way they obsess over that developer experience. They let us fine tune the index for the best results and report back what people are searching for, even servicing search terms that get zero results, which we love. Check the show notes for a link to get started for free, or head to algolia.com to learn more. So in the last segment, we kind of talked a little bit about getting into open source and um, maybe some paths that you might take to actually becoming a maintainer or, or um, contributing active, actively to projects. But one uh, much easier way to contribute to projects is uh, by interacting with the project and making requests for features or contributing fixes or um, just writing up bugs or, or documentation changes, things like that. Uh, to any project. And so in this next section, I thought we'd talk about uh, some advice for interacting with maintainers and what the best way uh, to go about that is. As is the kind of main theme of this, uh, people are the main part of open source. Uh, So what do you think is the best way to go about a feature request, for example? Yeah, I guess I would say you kind of need to go into it maybe knowing that it might not be what you uh, initially set out to be. it might be better to create an issue talking about your what the use case is and the thing that you're asking for might not be what they're it might not fit with the overall project unless it's something like it's really small scoped like it's unlikely that exactly what you're looking for is going to happen so i think talking through that beforehand would be better unless it's small enough you could probably just make the pr and then they'll just land it but you kind of have to have a good idea of what that looks like yeah, it really seems like something that you have to think about is uh, not really your specific use case, but how this fits into the more general use of the project, whether that's Babel, for example, that's used by everyone. So having something that is very specific to, to something that you want fixed that might not have a big appeal to everyone else, it's probably less likely that something like that is going to get landed. 
Yeah, I mean, well, okay. I want to say a few things first. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot. When in doubt, log an issue. Like, don't don't get too hung up on like you know worrying about the exact perfect way to say things. Like, when mm-hmm. in doubt, log an issue because it's just better to get that feedback and to start the process than to not. Just like you know, be nice. Don't be like super entitled about it. And also, maintainers be nice. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of like not nice maintainers. But as far as like the sort of the most constructive way to frame something like that, like I always fall back to a uh, job to be done theory, which is like. It's it's essentially like a business theory from Clay Christensen who um, did disruption theory, and the principle is that like we don't buy products, we hire things to do a job, right? So like I hire this meal to give me the calories to move on with my day, right? And there are lots of different meals that might fit into that, but like sometimes the most efficient one is like the one that I can take on the go or or something like that, right? When you start to look at like you know you're you're analyzing an iPad versus a laptop. Um, you can get a laptop that is cheaper and does more things <laughs> actually than an iPad. And yet people keep buying iPads because the jobs that they're hiring them to do are not all of those things that a laptop does. It's just a subset. And that subset is works better on the iPad, right? Um, so you can create better experiences if you understand the job that people are trying to hire it to do. So what I try to do always with people sort of requesting anything is, is like unwind them a little bit and try to understand what they're trying to hire this thing to do. And so w- when you describe like, what you were trying to do in terms of not just the, the feature that you want to see or how you're conceptualizing the solution, but just the job that you're trying to hire this to do and where that fits, then um, people can often work with you to figure out what feature might need to be added and what it might look like to solve that use case, or um, if it actually might be out of the scope of the project. And you know, here are some pointers to things that you can plug into this to, to solve that. That's usually the best way to go about it because... So the vast majority of the time that you're asking for a feature, you're you're not saying this must be in this project. You're just saying like, I need to do this thing and it is not clear to me how to do that. Um, and so either point me in the direction of, of where that th- where that solution exists um, or like let's talk through how to solve that in this project. Um, yeah, the, I think often the worst thing that you can do is come with a full solution to the problem uh, because so often like, you, you have not yet spent enough time with that library to internalize all of the constraints that they're under and why that might not be a great fit with some of the other stuff that's going on. Um, you, you may have a, a really good understanding of what you're trying to do with it, but not of what everyone else already does with that project. So. Right, and that's like the role of the maintainer to actually not just write the code and all the features, but then look through the ecosystem and see how it's used and figure out like what's the general solution for this. Um, and it's like, yeah, like you said, it's easy for maintainers to dismiss it because maybe they saw that request like 20 times, but maybe that's a good thing because then they're like, okay, it seems like a lot of people are actually asking for this, so maybe we should look into it. So you're saying things like that are still helpful, even though coming in, you might feel a little worried that you're going to be like disrupting your day to try and bring up this topic and discuss it. It's still worth bringing it up because it it helps maybe contribute to a larger problem that you that other people are might trying maybe trying to solve so it helps kind of get that onto your radar a little bit better yeah it's always better to know than not to know yeah. i mean a good example of this is like i understand all of the places in which people violate HTTP specs and OAuth specs because of the issues coming into request. So they, these are not bugs in requests. These are actually bugs in, in other people's software, including Flickr. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're not case insensitive about their headers and things like that. You run into, ca- into all these cases where like, oh yeah, the, the actual world that people are in, <laughs> living in and the environment of the internet is, is pretty brutal. Um, <laughs> and that is like really good feedback when you're designing new APIs and systems and, and maybe it actually like this is not necessarily a request bug but it's probably something that request needs to consider right like I think request ended up writing an entire new library called caseless that uh, in order to do headers so that we could still think about headers in a not case specific way but preserve casing if you set it because you might be dealing with the server that is violating the spec <laughs> um, and so like all, all of that sort of ends up uh, coming into the project and and eventually can make it better like every you know this isn't my bug thing is actually Mm -hmm. like kind of good feedback about what people are using the software for Mm. um yeah and also for me i mean i I did one of the many rewrites of the http client in node um and a lot of that you know was driven by all the bugs that i saw people complaining about that were actually core bugs but 
they came through request because people were using request and saw the bug and they don't know if it's in core and request or not. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's another tough thing is there's, because it's a, a tool chain or a pipeline of several different projects, it might not actually be the code that you're maintaining that is the cause of the bug. And so you might have to go uh, deeper into that uh, package inception to, to figure out where it is uh, or redirect people, which uh, can be very difficult. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's really interesting having to, uh, that example, like you don't want to make request support, uh, like non spec things like case sensitive, um, headers, for example, but you don't want to break <laughs> the end. Like you don't want to push people away from the project just because it exists out in the wild in an incorrect way. So yeah, yeah that, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, what about some tips and tricks for reporting bugs, uh, or, uh, actually, uh, helping to push them through to get fixed? So I think a lot of people complain about like just stars and thumbs ups and things like that, like in an issue when they want it to get fixed. But like, <laughs> I, I, have, I feel like they're haters and that like that actually is sort of useful feedback sometimes to, to know how much other people might care about an issue. It can become a distraction. <laughs> my, my favorite example of this is um, I used to like uh, basically t- do a, a manual collection of project metrics um, before each Node.js board meeting to look at sort of what was going on in the org and you would see, you know, months where issue comments spiked commits went down (laughs) because (laughs) you would have, you'd have these issues that like, you know, where some kind of flame war happened or a bunch of people got really emotional about, and that just led to a drop in productivity for the rest of the maintainers. Right. So there is like, there is like a noticeable decline in real productivity. If you just like freak out about a tiny thing in an issue that blows up to hundreds and hundreds of comments, I would say that comment number 100 is officially not helpful. Uh, (laughs) Like if you want to set a bar like that, that's it. But no, I mean, I, I think especially with with the the hearts and the, and the thumbs up, so you don't have to have comments for that now is really nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and use and the platform. Op- yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like it often does give you a sense of like how much people care about something, and th- and that could change how much you want to prioritize things. But I mean, the best way to ensure that something gets fixed is to fix it. Like I mean, to <laughs> send a pull request, right? Um, even if it's not uh, complete, right? Like uh, you know, if, it, if most of the way there, and you need extra feedback, like. The pull request with working code is a good way to start that conversation and has, you know, much more real things that people can talk through. Um, often, too, like, I end up in these situations where I, I have so much of the context of, of the code in my head, right? And it's not really written down. It would take a really long time to explain it to somebody. And so when somebody comes and says, like, oh, I want this feature, and I'm like, it's going to be really hard and I don't really have time. If somebody just wrote up, like, the start of a pull request that, that wasn't complete. And this has happened a few times where they, they mm-hmm. started it and I was like, well, like, okay, this thing isn't going to work this way. And like, you need to look over here, but that was still like a 10th of the work that it would have taken to explain everything from scratch. Right. I had mm-hmm. specific things that I could comment on and point to and say like, Oh no, no, this thing is over here. Like do it, do it that way. And that, that whole process is just a lot easier. Like the moment that you have real code to talk about, everything gets easier. So. Yeah, you're kind of leading into a question I was going to ask, which is how do you kind of maintain uh, a balance between like when a feature request or a bug issue gets written, how do you maintain a balance between maybe helping someone, like pushing them into helping contribute via pull request versus just doing it all because you, uh, like you said, you have a lot of the context in your head and you kind of know exactly where to go. I would love to help out on on projects, but I don't have that context. And so maybe I don't fully understand the problem or I don't understand where to, to quickly jump in or, or even not quickly, but where to jump in at all. Um, and do you, do you strike a balance between trying to educate others and help, um, groom them into contributing to the project versus just fixing it on your own? I feel like it depends on the issue. Like if it's clearly a regression, everyone's complaining, you probably don't want to wait for someone to do it. So you would just have to do it at that point. Mm -hmm. But I feel like a lot of things are just like, you know, there's a bug and you can just, I mean, it's fine if it's like, it's not like you don't want to fix it, but you're, you're okay with waiting for someone to figure it out. And yeah, I think it's kind of on maintainers to come up with like better contributing guides and tutorials kind of thing. You know, I I think it's good that we have stuff like live streaming now and uh, YouTube and um, those, I guess, yeah, video courses and stuff. I think projects could do more in-depth guides on like how things work Mm -hmm. that would help. 
Yeah, I mean, if you think about it from the point of view of like a person who stumbles upon this issue or maybe even the person that logged it, but they're looking at it and they're looking, f what are they looking for before they write code to fix it, right? So one might just be a clear signal from the maintainer that it's something that they would accept. So they know that they're not wasting their time. So mm -hmm. just saying like a comment from a leader in the project saying like, yeah, this would be really cool. Like, like send us a pull request it is actually really useful. Pointers that, that might give them some insight into where to put it are always really helpful. Um, if you have those or if those are obvious. Um, and you know, th that's the kind of stuff that a contributing guide doesn't always cover. Right. Like, yeah. um, you know, like the, the area of the code that this particular feature is, it needs to be in is, is always a little tricky. Also, like if, if when you think about it, you immediately go like, okay, this part's going to be hard or like it needs to be integrated with this thing. Um, those are pretty non and obvious to people that aren't familiar with the code. So just like laying those out really quick in a comment really helps too. And, you know, I've, I've done that in issues and seen them sit for months. And then somebody just randomly sort of goes like, oh, yeah, I, here's a pull request. I wrote that because there's, there's quite a few people that com come across these issues. And, um, you know, if it's something that they're even a little bit familiar with, they go like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I could I could go write that. Like, I'll, I'll spend an afternoon. Yeah. So I guess like you just kind of mentally think, how would you solve this? And like, just think about it for a few minutes and then write that down and then people can go with that. Oh, and also encouraging uh work in progress PRs as well. Um, because a lot of projects have really strict rules about like, don't send a PR until it's ready to be integrated and stuff like that. So if you want to use the review process as a way to continue to work with people and educate them, like let, make sure to let people know that that's um, totally useful to say, you know, put this in front of the title or add this tag or something like that. Oh, well, GitHub. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They mm -hmm. actually have uh, draft PRs now. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't even know about this. Yeah. I'm, still, I'm still putting big work in progress brackets around my titles. <laughs> <laughs> that is good too because it, it does show, uh, like if you're wanting to contribute to a project and so you go to the issues list, if you see a draft PR, then you know that somebody is actually working on that. It might be assigned to somebody, but they may have never looked at it. But if there's actually code out there, somebody kind of has started that process. And so it kind of helps you to filter, uh, as someone coming to the project, filter down to something that maybe hasn't been touched yet. And so you can get get your mark in there with that. Yeah, I think it would be nice if GitHub would link that. So it'd be, as a maintainer, it'd be nice to see like, oh, which issues are being worked on, quote unquote, and then you could know which ones to review. And then people that are looking into that, they could know that someone's working on it. Maybe they can collaborate or be like, oh, I tried this, it, this, this test case wasn't working or something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow, this feature was released in February. I did mm -hmm. not know about this. Wow, I thought this was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's fairly new uh the only issue i tend to have with it is uh i usually have to mark after it's been a draft i have to mark it as ready for review and then push another commit to it to trigger ci to go again Ah, uh, okay uh, that tends to be the problem right now so when it's in the draft state people can't review it they can't or, merge it or yeah. you can't merge it okay okay but people can still review it and you have the whole all the review tools okay yep. cool very cool yeah. So, um, how about giving pra praise or thanks to a project? Um, is that something that you you tend to like? Is it distracting? Does it invite uh, negative feedback in, in some ways? No, nope, I, I feel like um, <laughs> it's so rare that I, I would hope that everyone appreciates that kind of thing. Oh, that's so sad that it's rare. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think I talked about this a lot. Like it's pretty rare for someone to make an issue about it because it's called an issue. So it's already like negative. And then on Twitter, maybe, but most of that is like people complaining to the Twitter ether that, you know, something doesn't work. So it's more that when you go to like a meetup or a conference, people will be really nice to you. I don't think anyone would say that to your face, but like online people can say whatever they want. So, yeah. Yeah. I, it, it is really rare. And I, yeah, I've experienced the same thing where like in person people are much more um, giving about positive feedback than, than online. So it is always really good to see. I know that like since I have a little bit more of a following than like an average developer, like on Twitter or whatever, I have, I've spent more time going out of my way to praise people and to talk mm. about projects that I like um, because it, it seems to have like a, a bigger sort of reverberation and gets other people like starting like, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, this does look really cool. Yeah, yeah. Or, this is really good. Um, and that's only backfired, I think, once or twice where <laughs> that project wasn't quite ready for that level of attention. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, th I remember in the really early days of Greenkeeper, I was like, oh, this is so rad and tweeted about it and got a lot of people tweeting about it and their infrastructure wasn't quite ready to handle that many people signing up right away. <laughs> the Michael effect. 
<laughs> well, yeah. And then I think I added requests to it. And then I just like, okay. I don't know. They, they all add, like, they all used request and then I updated request. And that was like, you know, that had this big fan out effect uh, in Greenkeeper. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they, they weren't complaining to me about it. They were just like, oh man, yeah, we just had to like <laughs> really buckle down and add some infrastructure for that one. <laughs> um, they appreciated, you know, more people using it. Hmm. Yeah. And like the thing that I keep bringing up lately is like the, the Pika package stuff. Um, I think that it looks really cool. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I think it's like a really big kind of leap in, in terms of tooling and thinking about the platform and, um, to some extent is sort of catching us up with where the platform is. Like the platform's improved a lot since we started building these big tool chains and it's worth sort of going back to basics and thinking like, what can we do without all these tool chains and what, what would new tools look like that take advantage of all the new platform features? Um, even if we have to throw away a lot of what we'd done before. So. Yeah. And, um, just to, to plug JS party, uh, we actually talked to the maintainer of Pika on episode 69. Uh, so definitely go back and check that out. Cool. Was that Fred or the other maintainer? Uh, yeah, Fred. Fred K. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fred's great. Fred used to contribute to Request, actually, back in the day. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Full circle. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you mentioned that, that like coming up to you at conferences or praising on Twitter are really good ways to do that. I kind of agree. It, like, it, it seems weird to open an issue because it seems like that's the, the weird place, although I have seen it and I don't think mm-hmm. that it's ever taken negatively. But uh, like you said, Henry, the... It's not an issue. It's an issue in the best possible way, I guess. Uh, but there's no real solution to it. So then you just close it. Do you leave it open? Mm-hmm. Very, very <laughs> weird. <laughs> Some people have real OCD about that. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, yeah. like I, I've given up, right? Like yeah. I'm one of these big impox people where I'm just like, ah, screw it. Like they're just open, whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean like JDD, I know is just like militant about closing issues right away. <laughs> so yeah. I think some people would appreciate it less than others. Sure. I think if, by and large, I think people would appreciate it. I, I would just caution against having like a, a day or like a Twitter thread where you were like encouraging a lot of people to open these on the same day. Cause then people that are involved in a lot of projects are just going to see their inbox fill up with oh, yeah. <laughs> new threads, <laughs> praising different projects. I mean, in a way it's also more effective if people just do it on their own, right? Like, Asynchronously, yeah. rather than, I mean, at that point, you get a hundred thank yous. You're like, okay, now what? You know, like if it's just one <laughs> off, it's like you actually appreciate it more when it's just one person. So, yeah, totally. I tend to try and and just put like a comment in a, a real issue. Like, I'm having this problem, but before I say that, I just want to say I love this project or <laughs> you know something like that. So it's oh, a little bit of nice. praise, uh, but it's still relevant and totally an issue. Uh, the other thing I really like to do is um, if I feel like I have the skills ask for maybe some feedback on how to maybe approach that. So if it is something where I, I don't have the context built up, but I'd like to contribute, uh, I might say like, you know, I know you're busy or I'd, um, I'd love to, to contribute a fix to this. If you can point me in the right direction or, or let me know about anything that I might not be thinking about in terms of this issue. Yeah. Hmm. I like that. I like just like having the praise in there, mm-hmm. like c- couching the sort of, uh, the like I'm having this issue stuff. That's always that's always really cool. Yeah. Um, often when I when I log an issue, I'm like, hey, I'm having this problem. Like, and then I'll just outline exactly like what I can commit to in terms of fixing it. <laughs> like, I have like you know I, I I've looked at this code base. Like, I can probably fix it if you can point me in the right direction. Like, I can put in the time for that. Or I'll literally just say like, just letting you know about this. I don't have the time to fix it. If you can't fix it, I understand. <laughs> I'm also busy. That's really good feedback too. And it's something that might be weird to bring up. Like, it, I don't know, like mm. it, it just seems like, you know, you're talking about people's time and if, if they come back and say, oh, I can't do that. It's not that they don't care about the issue that you're bringing up. It's just that they literally don't have time to, to do that. And it's, it can be tough to bring that type of stuff up. At least it can to me. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like with the issue template, like we want people to give as much information up front so you don't have to do this back and forth thing where people don't understand the like, context or expectations. Yeah. Nine out of 10 times I delete that issue template though. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I know. An issue. <laughs> like I'm going to get you this information if it's relevant, but yeah, no, exactly. I, I think it'd be funny to, if GitHub had stats, like how many people like just do the Control A, delete, and then just paste something in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and people have bots now that like complain when you do that. It's uh-huh, like, no, yeah. no, shut up. Like, like this is like this is meaningful feedback that your template is dumb. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. I'm. I'm like. I was really actually against the templates when they came out, and I, and I still feel like they may be 
like more pain than they're worth in a lot of scenarios. The best that I've seen actually are just like sure. when, um, yeah, really short ones or when you have a set of templates and th that set of templates really tells, like Specific. encourages people to do different kinds of issues where like they may not know if they can just create a discussion issue and if this is the right place for that. But if they see a template in the template picker, they're like, oh, yes, that is what I'm supposed to do. So it can also be like an encouraging mechanism. Um, also, like I work at a company where like just the entire company internally is organized on GitHub in private repos. And so we, we have a lot of like internal processes where the template lays out all the things that they need in order to complete the process, which is super useful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've also um, there's this like hidden feature in uh, issue creation where you can attach a bunch of stuff to the query string to mm -hmm. refill out those boxes. Yeah. And yeah, we've done some really cool stuff integrating that into products like Proto School, where like if somebody is learning something thing and they have an issue we you know the link actually contains a bunch of contextual information mm -hmm. about where they were at in the lesson and fills out all that stuff for them and all of that so um i think that yeah that, like there's a lot that we can do to like reduce the barrier on individuals to fill all that stuff out if we have that context yeah i know you can change like the title and the body and now you can add labels which is cool like uh, you know it makes sense that each template could have its own label so like this is a bug fixed issue then it automatically adds that right yeah nice that's awesome. I didn't know that, that you could do that. So you could just create a say praise um, template and then it'll <laughs> automatically add the won't fix label. Yes. <laughs> and close automatically. Yeah. yeah. We call it like not a bug or something rather than won't fix. <laughs> <laughs> I'm or, never going to fix your praise. Or, yeah, I know. Or we'll just leave it open forever. That's true. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Gage. Gage is a free and open source test automation tool by ThoughtWorks. The goal of the tool is to take the pain out of test automation and to help with this, Gage supports specifications of Markdown, which are easy to read and easy to write, reusable specifications to simplify your code, which makes refactoring easier, and less code means less time maintaining code. And finally, integrations. Use Gage with your favorite tools and your IDEs in the ecosystem of your choice. Selenium, Saihi Pro, CIC and CD tools like GoCD, Jenkins, Travis, and IDE support for Visual Studio, VS Code, IntelliJ, and more. Head to gage.org slash jsparty to learn more and give it a try. Again, gage.org slash jsparty. All right, so um, maintaining open source uh, can be a big challenge, and it's always good to get praise to uh, know that your time and the contrib contributions that you're putting into it are appreciated by uh, the users and the people who are using it. But there is much more to self-care that uh, we'd like to deep dive into a little bit more. Uh, so what are some things that you can do to uh, take care of yourself as a, an open source maintainer uh, and help you avoid um, burnout, which seems to be so common? The obvious and hard thing to do is literally stop working on it. <laughs> and it's like, it's funny because we're like trying to convince all these people to do open source. And and then at the same time, you're getting like frustrated or working at so much. And then you're like trying to, I don't know, manage like how many notifications you're getting and answering everyone's Twitter thing and going on like talks and podcasts and saying yes to everything. It's like, how do you learn to say no? Uh, and it's almost like <laughs> we're waiting until we literally like can't do it anymore. We like break down and then you like have to take a break because you have some physical issue or something, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, like unfortunate. But like, how do we actually get people to know that like coming in and maybe you, know, you have to just learn that like the hard way. But I don't know. For me, it's like not working on the weekend or like, especially now that I'm doing it full time. It's like, OK, trying to set like a set schedule if that works like having boundaries and stuff like that yeah for sure yeah <laughs> having a baby is is kind of amazing mm. in that it it changes uh, you have to get way better at time management and you definitely have to take breaks away from a keyboard uh, to do something that is not computers. So yeah. just have it, having that built in every morning and every evening and, and on the weekends as well has been amazing. But I, I've also started to recognize that all coding is not the same for me. There's certainly 
like working on something that is on top of a big framework or, you know, editing a large application or website or, or dealing with those kinds of bugs. It's just a very different activity than if I sit down and do something for me, usually like in a smaller open source project or solve some kind of small task. And so I've started just kind of outlining what that practice looks like for me, because not only is it like important for my mental health, like it is sort of like a weird, like meditative activity that makes me not go crazy. Um, especially during periods of time where like a lot of my work is not necessarily writing code that needs to ship. Um, so there are periods of time where I could go without having to write any code for work. And if that happens, then, then I really start to go a little nuts. Um, if I don't, if I don't like get some code time in, but yeah, I've just gotten much better at identifying the different practices and kind of rituals that I can do that make that time really productive. And also it, it really makes me a much better programmer and allows me to like think in code a lot better when I'm not programming. And yeah, so I've, I've started to write those out kind of um, separately in like, I, I don't know what it'll turn into at some point, like a blog post or something. But yeah, there's a million little self-care routines too that I do all the time, like taking big breaks and um, often by midday Friday, I'm, I'm a little burnt out. And so I, I will, I will just like go see a movie. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like nothing is going to happen that is work right now. <laughs> like I might as well just like go somewhere where I can't do it. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, totally. I've definitely done stuff like that. Like time shifting is something that I can do a little bit in my role. So I, I do take advantage of that knowing that I might not be productive, you know, right after lunch some days or depending on other circumstances. I have two kids, so sometimes I don't get sleep. And mm. being able to say, oh, I, I'll just take care of myself now and come back later, that really does help out a lot. Yeah. I've started to push myself less, actually, too. Yeah. And I found that the less I push myself, the more I get done and the better my code is. Like, if I don't feel like I know what the solution to a problem is yet, I will not sit down and try to write it. Mm. Um, I will like take a walk and think about it or <laughs> like literally just do anything else and let it like marinate for a little bit longer. And then when I sit down, it just, it comes out so quickly and it's usually much higher quality. Yeah. No, it honestly, it just takes a lot of faith in that sense. It's like not having to like have the urgency of like figuring it out right at this second, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like last night, I, I have a thing that I really need to get done like by the end of the week. And, um, Last night I was sitting down to do it and I was like, ah, I, I don't quite have it yet. And so instead I wrote something else, like an update to a library that I had that I've been trying to migrate the tests around because that was just like a, a thing that I knew that I could get done. I knew how to get it done and just sort of like powered through it. And yeah, at the end I was really satisfied. I got a good night's sleep. I've been thinking about it all day. And now like I'm pretty sure that by tonight it'll come really, really easily. And yeah, the time shifting thing definitely happens for me a lot too um, because I'm, I'm up so early to get our baby ready. And then, um, I work all day, but like I have odd meeting schedules because we're a hundred percent distributed. So like <laughs> I have people in Europe and in Australia. So uh, <laughs> there's some interesting stuff that happens there. <laughs> and yeah, so often, you know, in the afternoon I will like, you know, take some of the bigger breaks and like get, um, you know, dinner ready and things like that. And then after she goes to sleep, um, I'll then get like, that's my, my biggest section of kind of uninterrupted, like two or three hours to just knock out some good code. But yeah, yeah, that's that's the nice thing about working from home and for an entirely distributed team is that there's not a lot of expectations around like, you know, this particular time you need to be doing this particular thing. So. Yeah. yeah, totally. And Henry, I'm, I'm glad you brought up um, that, that it really is just faith and that I was reading the, um, I think it was the blog post, uh, your blog post about starting that podcast, Hope and Source, and mm -hmm. uh, kind of how you saw the similarities between faith and the faith in yourself to to do this open source and, that, and that's really cool seeing that similarity and building off of that would you also say that um maybe starting these podcasts uh has has helped you in that as well as part of self-care being able to talk about mm. what's going on more and to commiserate is the wrong word but <laughs> discuss with other people in, in similar situations as you yeah well i guess i never thought about it that way but i think it's funny that i have to do a podcast to do that because um <laughs> <laughs> but it's true I, i've talked about it on previous podcasts it's like it's a great way to have a of a conversation like for you know an hour or so with you know with people that care about the same things and it's like if we're struggling with being a maintainer or doing open source and knowing that other people have those same problems and talking through them yeah, and not knowing that, you know, we don't really know the answer, but like we're all figuring this out together. I think that's helpful to just, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Ah, oh, yeah. I read this interesting book or I'm like halfway through it. 
about habits and about how to form habits and how to sort of get rid of bad habits. Mm -hmm. And as you're reading it, it, it's so obvious, like all of the things (laughs) that they're saying are so obvious, but also like whenever I set out to do something new, I never do any of this stuff, (laughs) like, and usually fail at like keeping up with that. Right. Um, But one of like, you know, trying to structure things so that you have to do something or you can't do something that you don't want to be doing. Right. Like if you don't have junk food in your house, you will not eat it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like that is a very basic thing that you should probably do um, if that is a habit that you want to have. Another one that I really like is um, like what he calls habit stacking, which is uh, you take habits that you already do regularly and you start like layering other things on top mm. of them um, so that they end up being the thing that preempts you to do the next thing. Yeah, that's that's been really cool. Yeah, um, like a, a trigger to another habit. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like so much of self-care is not that we don't know what to do. It's that like, we just don't do it consistently. Enough. Right, mm-hmm. right. And, and especially like once we get some benefit out of it, we then like take all of those gains and roll them into like the next sprint of burning ourselves out <laughs> and, <laughs> and don't like continue to do with them. Right. Like I don't meditate as regularly as I should, but just the process of, of learning transcendental meditation and then doing it regularly for quite a while made it like so clear how different the effects of a practice are versus like just something that you do occasionally. Mm-hmm. Like now that I do it occasionally, the gains that I get from it are not nearly as big as um, the gains that I was getting when I was doing it twice a day. Um, like it just it, it just compounds and continues to get better and, and you get better at it and, and the benefits that you see. Whereas now like I, I don't have a habit about it anymore which is a problem and I, I tend to use it like when I'm having some other kind of bigger issue but even having it to fall back on now is, is pretty useful. So Yeah. I also say like being able to do it in a group I would hope that it gets you to do it on your own too but Sometimes that's hard. So, uh, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, not every habit you can do yeah. in a group, but that's one of the things in the book where he's like, you know, if you can build a community of people uh-huh. around doing it, like your chance of success and continuing to do it is much, much higher. Is this Atomic Habits by chance? Yes, <laughs> I yes, just yes. read that book. So, oh, right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's sounding very familiar. I'm like in the yeah, I'm in like the middle of the audiobook actually. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't have room for audiobooks. Like, the, here's the funny thing though, like listening to podcasts and audiobooks, like I don't need to build a habit around that because now if I am walking somewhere, just like that's on. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> like there are all these spaces in my day that I know will fit into that, and now I just go for it. Right. Like I don't have to try to to push myself to like you know read more and things like that. Okay. Okay. So uh, in the break, I created a repository. Uh, at github slash michael m-i-k-e-a-l slash self dash care uh, mm-hmm. where i i want to actually collect some of these self-care routines and get other people's thoughts on them as well in like an open source way so uh yeah if people have things they'd like to share go there i'm starting to share a few now like i had a lot of wrist pain for a while and came up with a way to kind of resolve some of that so oh nice yeah this is awesome uh, we'll definitely put that in the show notes so check that out cool it's a great show yeah it was really great uh, Henry, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I would really just encourage our listeners to say thank you to you uh, because if you're using <laughs> JS, you're probably using <laughs> Babel. And um, I'm very appreciative of it. Um, you should should show him that praise. Maybe not all create an issue, but uh, definitely <laughs> talk about Babel and talk about his other work. Definitely follow, uh, follow you on Twitter. Check out your Patreon and uh, your two podcasts um, and upcoming third one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Open yeah. Source, Maintainers Anonymous. And um, I can't remember if you mentioned what the third one was. I actually tweeted about the name and I was like, maybe you should come up with it. Well, I think we might just call it the Babel podcast because it's easy. But I okay. remember I was like, oh, maybe we should call it like babbling about Babel or like some <laughs> funny thing. But I don't know. if. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll see. Yeah. Awesome. So I just want to I just want to reiterate. Henry lives off of his Patreon uh, yes. <laughs> donations right now. So like, if you appreciate you know having your code work in web browsers through <laughs> Webpack or all of the different frameworks built on <laughs> Webpack and Babel, like you should you and potentially your company should yeah. uh, try to give him some money on Patreon. Um, please do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He's too nice to promote himself, so uh, I will promote him. <laughs> I, I'm, wor- I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm like your hype man. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come out before and after things and like I'll get people excited for you and then uh-huh. afterwards be like money uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love the uh, the picture on your Patreon it's like mm-hmm. a picture of you with uh, a box that, that has like donations yeah. for Babel yeah. it's great <laughs> that was a real event <laughs> <laughs> you were saying you got like 200 bucks uh-huh. <laughs> that's amazing yeah. <laughs> that is so funny awesome this is a great show thank y'all yeah thank you thank you 
right. Thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor. Share this show with a friend. We're just an Apple podcast. Go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things around here at ChangeLaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash ChangeLaw. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at ChangeLaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.